Hey guys, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study. We're jumping back into Revelation 19 today. In our last session, we looked at the chronology, the structure of the book of Revelation, how Revelation 19 fits into it. So if you haven't watched that session, watch that one first, because there's a lot in there that is really uh, will, will guide us as we jump into this. Before we do, I just want to draw your attention to the Maranatha End Times Summit in Texas, Dallas, Texas, at the Gaylord Convention Center, July 13, 14, and 15. I'm going to invite you to join us. Go to maranathasummit.com for all the details. And if you're new to the FAI YouTube channel, subscribe. You'll get notifications when new content goes up, which is almost every single day. And as well, if you want to watch this without ads and you don't have a YouTube premium account and you're sick of all these ads, download the FAI app and you can get everything for free without ads, free, free forever. And there's tons of content on there. Okay, with that, let's jump right in. Revelation 19. We're going to look at four sections of this chapter today. Again, if you missed last week, go watch it. It's, it's very relevant for how we're going to unpack this. We're going to start in Revelation 19, verse 1, and we're going to go to verse 21. So we're going to work our way all the way through it in a very simple, I don't think this will be a long session. I want to keep it very succinct and to the point to give an outline and an overview so that we can go into the details of this incredible chapter in the days ahead. So there's four sections, four uh, very distinct themes being unpacked and unfolded, and chronologically so. Again, last week we talked about the importance of chronological grammar, meaning when we see in the text the, the phrase, and then I saw, and then I saw, or after that I saw, or I heard, you need to take that seriously. It's not open to interpretation to move the events around. These events take place in chronological order. So we're going to look at four of them today in these four distinct sections. Section one is verses one through eight. Verses one through eight. Now, within verses one through eight, what, we're going to, what we see here, let me go back to Revelation 19. I'm in the wrong chapter. What we see in Revelation 19 is three songs three songs. Now, these songs have very significant content. We're going to look at them in detail in the days ahead, but we're just doing a 10,000-foot flyby, flyover today to understand what we're looking at here. Now, in, in this, the first eight verses, we're going to, let's just read it, starting in verse one. After this, after, the, after what we just saw in Revelation 17 and 18 with Harlot Babylon, after this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, so they're crying out. This is, this is proclamation, it's prayer, it's worship, it's declaration. And we have our first song in verses 1 through 2. Now this is describing the judgment of the great harlot, the judging of the harlot Babylon, and the vengeance that is taken out upon her for the shedding of the blood of the righteous. And this describes her judgment and its praise for this. They say, hallelujah. And the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. Now, in verse 4, the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down, worshipped him. And, and from the throne, they heard a voice. So now we hear another song, declaration. Now, we don't know if there's a melody to this or if it's more a declaration. But I call them songs because it's, it's, there's a rhythm and rhyme to it. Praise our, and because of the content. Praise. Praise our God, all you, all you his servants who fear him, small and great. So the first voices are singing about declaring the judgment of God upon the harlot Babylon and the avenging of the blood of the righteous on the hands of the harlot. Now, in the second song, it's about praising God and fearing him. Everyone, small and great, fear him. Praise him, all you who fear him. This is a song of adoration. So a song, there's, the first song is judgment. The second one is adoration and an exhortation to fear the Lord. Now, in verses 6 through 8, it's, this, is, this is the beautiful one. Well, all three are beautiful. But then I heard what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude. Now, this isn't, you know, the, the first one is, is voices. The second one is a voice. And the third one is a great multitude. Like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. 
Now we're going to do a deep dive into this particular song, the third one. This third one is packed with implications, but again, we're doing a flyover today. So the first one is the judgment on the harlot of Babylon. The second one is an exhortation to praise, praise him, to worship him, to adore him, those who fear him. So if you fear him, praise him. Now the third one is the marriage supper of the lamb and the preparation of the bride of Messiah. The third one is absolutely amazing. So that's the first section. The first section is, verses 1 through 8, three songs. Now, I want to just point out that there's a kind of a mirrored structure here. In our first section, there's going to be a marriage supper of the lamb. You're going to see the word supper, a meal. And then when we get to verses 17 through 21, you're going to see another supper. And that's calling all of the birds of the air and beasts of the field to come feast on the flesh for the supper of the slain. So you have the marriage supper of the lamb. And you have, you could say, the marriage supper of the damned, which is the slain bodies of those that come against the Lord at the end who are slain in this final conflict. So you have the juxtaposition, the contrast, the the setting together of two suppers, one for the redeemed and one for the reprobate, one for those who rebel against the coming of the Lord at the coming of the Lord and the consequences for that. So we're talking eternal consequences here for the bride, for the harlot, and for those who rebel against the Lord. Because there's going to be many who who don't bow the knee to the harlot or the Antichrist, but they also don't bow the knee to the Messiah. And so the consequences for that is this other supper. It's not the marriage supper of the lamb. It's a slaughter. It is uh, mass bodies. I mean, it's very gruesome. The imagery is, is just, it's after war. Now, I've been in many war zones, and you know, it's, it's horrific when, you know, I remember being in Mosul after the battle for Mosul, and, you know, the bodies of ISIS fighters just, you know, littering the rubble and the stench and, you know, bulldozers cleaning out dead bodies and just rotting flesh and, you know, dogs and birds eating the flesh of human beings that are in the rubble. That's what Revelation 19 is describing, but on an apocalyptic scale never known before in humanity. So that's verses 1 through 8. Three songs, the, the, the judgment of the harlot, praise for the judgments of God, and the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the preparation, the readying of the bride. Now verses 9 through 10 is our next section. There are two commands in here. If you look at verse 9, Then the angel said to me, write this. That's the first command. Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And then John, it says, then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you, your brothers who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. That's the second command. So the first command is write this. The second command is don't do that. Worship God. Don't do that. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It it pains me to just move through this fast because I want to spend a whole session on just every one of these sentences. But again, I want to go through this. So we have three songs. Then we have two commands. The command is to write and the command is to don't do something, but do this instead. Don't fall down at my feet. Fall down at his feet. Worship him. Then we get to Revelation verse 11, and we have our third section. The third section is describing Jesus' appearing. Now, this is, this is phenomenal. The coming of the conquering king in the spirit of King David, like Joshua, coming. There's an actual physical procession. Now, we've talked about this in sessions before, but we'll go into detail in future sessions of this very large body of prophetic content that describes the the physical bodily procession of Messiah on the earth in very specific geographical places through very specific territory in the Middle East. The Jesus, like Moses, leads Jews in flight back into the covenantal land. And he, like Joshua, leads them on a conquest of the promised land. And like David, he'll lead them into the city of David, the city of Jerusalem, at the climax of that long procession. 
It's not as though Jesus just kind of flies back one day like Superman and goes, okay, it's over, it's done. No, he's coming. There's going to be human dynamics to this thing that are sweeping, that are like, they're going to take days and weeks and months. It's not going to happen in a moment. And Revelation 16 is describing this in very poetic language, but also very detailed. And I don't want to use the word literal language because I don't think sometimes that's not helpful to me. Well, that's metaphorical and that's literal. That that dichotomy, like that simplistic uh, polarity is bad logic to impose on scripture. You know, meaning the, the, the prophets didn't write in this kind of binary, well, this is metaphorical and this is literal. That's not... That's not how the book of Revelation works. If you're asking that question, you're asking the wrong set of questions. John is seeing the return of Jesus, and he's seeing it in a visual sense, because if, he, if it wasn't in a visual sense, he'd have to sit there for days, weeks, and months to actually see it play out exactly how it's going to play out. No, the Lord says, I want to, in, in brevity and succinctness, communicate to you visually what's going to happen. What's going to happen? Heaven's going to open. Jesus is going to come. He's going to be on a white horse. He's going to be covered in blood. And he's going to wage war on the rebellious nations of the earth. That's what we're looking at. Hey, guys. I want to remind you about our $5 a month giving campaign. If you want to have an impact on the unreached and unengaged of the world, if you want to see the gospel go forth into the 1040 window, it's as simple as giving $5 a month. We like to say you could give up a cup of coffee and, and change the Middle East. If you're interested in doing so, you can check out the link below. I believe it's faimission.org slash donate or faistudios.org slash donate. Thank you very much. Uh, I eh, I want to go through this in detail, but I'm not. I'm just going to read it. Uh, this is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite passages in all of Scripture describing Jesus returning. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems. He has a name that no one knows but himself. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he's called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is not a single phrase in this section, verse 11 through 16, that is not a direct quotation of the Old Testament. There's not a single phrase that's not pulled from, explicitly, deliberately, intentionally pulled from the Old Testament. It's amazing. Now, when we get into the details of this, we're going to jump into all those passages and build the, the, the visual detail of this as the prophets described it for us. So that's the third section, is the, the, the appearing of Jesus and the war that he wages as the greater Joshua, as the greater David, leading the final conquest, taking the stronghold of Zion, and taking the war to those who've rebelled against them. It's a direct confrontation with the nations. Now, we have lots of passages that talk about this final showdown, this final cataclysmic conflict at the end of the age, but this is describing it and kind of pulling all the threads together and knitting a tapestry out of all of those threads from the Old Testament. You get a very clear picture of what the physical bodily return of Jesus will look like when he splits the sky and when he returns to the earth in physical form. This isn't uh, some poetic description for like the gospel going forth. You'll read in some of the commentaries, like, oh, this is, this is a you know, very poetic language, which means the gospel is going forth through the church. No, no. <laughs> Jesus is coming on a horse, dipped in blood, covered in blood, waging war, Actually, legitimately, just like that. Like visually, the meaning of the imagery is Jesus is coming to make war. That's the message here. Jesus is coming to make war at the end of the age. He's coming to make war. It is not as though he's coming um, in some phantom metaphorical sense through some other manifestation and John's just seeing him bloody making war. No, he's going to be bloody actually making war. It's... 
Ah, I'm excited to get into this. Now, verse 17 through 21 is the fourth section. Verses 17 through 21, the fourth section. This is describing the day of the Lord, the day of God, the day of his wrath, the day of his fury, the day that he treads the winepress. This is the day that all the prophets described in vivid detail. This is the day when the enemies of God are vanquished. This is when the rebellion is put down. This is the end. This is the climax. This is the, the, the pinnacle of all of the story about the mounting and the maturity of evil. The wheat and the tares rising together. The final open confrontation between the powers of darkness and the power of light embodied in the physical form of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah of Israel. Amazing. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. Just, it's, it's so cinematic. You picture an angel standing silhouetted in the sun. And a voice, a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. Come gather for the great supper of God. So you have the marriage supper of the lamb and you have the great supper of God. The great supper of God to eat the flesh of the kings the flesh of captains, commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. This is what I mean by it's not right to ask literal or metaphorical. You're asking, what does it mean? Because at the end of the age, you know, the conflict is not going to be on horses like it was back then. Because why? Because at the end of the age, there was tanks and airplanes and nuclear weapons, AK-47s and handguns and grenades and RPGs and ICBMs. What John is receiving is not a literal or metaphorical. What he's receiving is a visual representation that anyone could understand with a simple approach, which is this. When Jesus returns to wage war, a lot of people are going to die in the battle and their corpses are going to be feasted on by the birds of the air and by the beasts of the field. So don't expect that the final conflict is going to be uh, old school horses clashing as armies ride at each other, you know, Braveheart style, or Lawrence of Arabia even. You know, like he, even Lawrence of Arabia would have looked so crazy. You know, wow, trains and airplanes? No, like the, tech, the technological component of the final war is something that John, if he looked at it, he'd be like, what the heck is that? He wouldn't even know how to describe it. And I'm grateful for that. The fact that this, because you can look at it and go, well, are you saying, Dalton, that literally horses and riders are going to be waging this war? No, because that's a false dichotomy. It's a choice that you shouldn't have to make when you're reading the book of Revelation, literal or metaphorical. That's the wrong approach completely. What we're looking at here is not the question, is it metaphorical? Is it literal? The question is, what does it mean? What's What's the implication Because again, we see songs being sung, we see Jesus returning, and then we see the outcome of him waging war in verses 11 through 16. The outcome of that is 17 through 21, which is all the slain of the earth and birds eating their rotting flesh out in the open air because the battle's over. The battle is over. When the marriage supper of the Lamb is taking place, the the supper of God is also taking place. As the rebellious, the reprobate, are bearing the consequences for going up against him at the end. And the description here is just heavy. Verse 19, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him, who was sitting on the horse and against his army. Open confrontation between the beast, the Antichrist, and the Messiah. And his people and his people. It's the final showdown. Verse 20. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. Captured. Captured. Interesting terminology here. Captured. These two, the beast and the false prophet, were thrown alive, thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds who were gorged with their flesh. 
So the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. And the rest of his people are slain by the sword that come from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with, gorged with their flesh. So four sections. We have three songs. Section one. Section two, we have two commands. Section three, we have the coming of Messiah and his war that he wages. And then verses 17 through 21, the fourth section, what we see here is the day of the Lord. What we see here is the great supper of God, the consequences, the capture of the beast and the false prophet, the th- throwing them into the lake of fire, dealing vengeance and justice and retribution, reckoning upon the heads of those who fought with and behind and alongside of the Antichrist during the Great Tribulation. This is the end of the Great Tribulation. What we see here is described throughout the Old and the New Testament. Paul called it the day of Christ, the day of God, the day of wrath. Jesus described it in Revelation, or sorry, in Matthew 24 and 25. He said, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will grow dark, the powers of the air will fall, then the Son of Man will be revealed and he will come and he will set up his throne. Now, the context of setting up his throne is in, is in the vicinity, is in the, the conceptual context of a great war and a great battle. What we're moving towards as we get further into the book of Revelation is an open conflict and a war on the earth between Messiah and those who rebel against him. So I'm going to leave it there. We're going to leave this as a short session. That's the overview of Revelation 19 in our next session. I don't know if it's going to be next week. I'm traveling quite a lot this month. So I'm going to try to do jump in and do another session, but next week might be... Might be a week off, so keep an eye out for it. We have a really heavy uh, two months coming up with production of our new films and documentaries, and I'm traveling um, all over the continents, on multiple continents over the next couple weeks. So I might see you next week, and if not, we'll catch you on the week that follow. So guys, thanks for watching this. Go check out MaranathaSummit.com and join us in Dallas for the End Times Summit this summer. Thanks for watching. Blessings and Maranatha.